moments where, you know, the goodness of the Lord just overwhelms us, right? And um, as I said, nobody knows what the Lord has done for me. Like, we don't know what the Lord has done for you. And sometimes we can be a little like, what's going on over there? What's going on over there? Somebody's thinking about the goodness of Jesus, man. The fact that he brought them out. They thought life was over. But he's saying he came by. As it says in Ezekiel 16, I believe it is. He says, you shall live and not die. You shall live and not die. There's a verse I want us to look at real quickly. And they're going to keep playing so you know we're quickly ending, okay? Didn't we appreciate the music by the worship team and the band? Can we put our hands together and thank God for them? And thank you guys for your patience. We have some food for you downstairs. Um, you know, the book of Isaiah, many call it the gospel because uh, the first 39 chapters of it, it deals with kind of like law. You know, there's no gospel apart from law. You have to have law in order to appreciate the gospel, right? You have to understand the condemnation. You have to understand the penalty to understand, I should say, to appreciate the grace and mercy that Jesus brings. So the first 39 chapters in the book of Isaiah is one where Isaiah is prophesying doom doom and gloom. Why? Because of the rebelliousness of the people, not listening to God. God speaks. They don't listen. His word is available, but they don't read it. They don't adhere to what God asks them to do. But then as God is prophesying to them and telling them, I should say Isaiah, through, because God has used them, as he's prophesying, saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be taken into captivity. The Babylonians are going to come. You're going to be ensnared by them and so on and so forth. You have that for the first 39 chapter. But then also God prophesies before they even go in. It says this, though. But you know what? I want to remind you of something. In chapter 43, he says, I want to remind you that you are the redeemed. I want to remind you that I've chosen you. I want to remind you that I'm called, that you're called by my name. I want to remind you that though there may be rivers, you won't drown. There may be fires, but you won't be burned. It's like, wait a minute, but God, we, we've been bad. We've been rebellious. We haven't done what you told us to do. Shouldn't all these things happen to us? God says, you don't get it. You're called by my name. Just because you act up doesn't discard you from being my son or my daughter. You still belong to me. As I've often reminded myself of this because my own life at times and the prodigal son, you remember, he's out there doing his thing, but the condition did not change his position. And so you may act up, you may have acted up, but guess what? God's call in your life is still there. His gifts and calls are without repentance, the scripture says, right? And God already knew what you were going to do and how you are going to act up. And God already knew how he was going to straighten you out as well. Because there are things that God allows to happen to us to straighten us out. One psalmist said it like this, it was good for me that I was afflicted, for it has taught me to obey your decrees, taught me to obey your word is what it says. Well, the first 39 chapters, doom and gloom, but then from chapters 40 all the way through chapter uh, 66, it's more of the gospel, right? So it's more of like comfort. So from condemnation to comfort, the Lord reminds them that he's there for them. So I want to encourage you to read Isaiah 43, especially first seven verses. But then we jump down to this. Here's how I want to end, because I believe that the Lord wants to say this to us today. All right, I'm no prophet. I'm going to tell you what the Spirit of God is impressing upon my heart to say to us today from his word. Now, there are scripture verses that are specific to Israel, right? It's not for you and me. We can adhere to some of the principles of it, and we can get the character of God based on the promises that he's making, but some are very specific for Israel. And then there are others that we can apply for ourselves, like the if-then. There are if-then promises that God gives. Well, here in chapter 43, verse 15, here's what it says as God is talking to his people. He says, I am the Lord, and we need to stop there. Whenever you see Lord, remember, it speaks about Yahweh, the one who's self-existent. There's no beginning, there's no end. He has all power. He creates all things, can do all things. He is the Lord. Everybody say, he's the Lord. He's That's the right, he's the Lord. Notice what he says, your holy one. Now he's making it personal. Your holy one. Israel's creator and king. Israel's, in other words, guys, understand something. You didn't create yourself. I created you. You were not a people, but I made you a people. You were nobodies, but I'm the one who chose Abraham. And for me choosing Abraham, you became a great nation, becoming a great nation. So I am Israel's creator, but don't you ever forget I'm also your king. Remember, you're, you're, I'm, you're, you're, you should be my loyal subjects, but even when you're not my loyal subjects, it doesn't stop me from doing what I'm called to do, which is to be your king, your ruler, the one who watches over you, provides for you, the one who takes care of his kingdom. In 2 Timothy in chapter 2, it says this, even it says when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot disown himself. The moment you have his name, the moment you belong to him, guess what? He will never disown you. Never will he leave you, nor will he forsake you. He is your king. Amen. Let's put our hands together. Somebody started that. I think we should all agree to that. He is our king. 
So he's reminding them, okay, I'm your king. Now remember, he already told me this was going to happen, you guys. It's going to be captivity. But also I want to just comfort you that after you get a little papau, it's going to be a long papau, but while you, after you get this papau, I want you to know, hey, I'm still your king. I'm still your creator. I'm still the Lord. And then he goes on in chapter verse 16. He says, I am the Lord, reminds him again, who opened the way through the waters, making a path through the sea. Again, whenever, listen, God is always reminding his people about what he did for them. That's why the Exodus story is one that is never forgotten. This is why they, they ha we have Passover. This is why we talk about it all the time. Why? Because it's a constant reminder. Look, you were in captivity and you could not bring yourself out. It took me to bring you out. And I did what I had to do to get the attention of the Egyptians to release you. I could have done it instantaneously, but I was wondering, seeing if you were going to put your trust in me. But I brought you out. It is a reminder for you and me. As we find ourselves enslaved to whatever it may be, to sin, to fear, to anxiety. Listen, you can't bring yourself out. Because if you could, you would have done it already. If the alcohol could work, it would have worked already. If the drug could work, it would have worked already. It may numb you, but how many know you still, well, maybe you don't know. You make up with still a headache. And the problem is still there. And now you got a new addiction. He's the one who delivers. He's the one who sets free. He says, remember, I opened the way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. And if you remember the Red Sea, listen, it was a sea. But God is the one who caused the sea to become a pathway for them to get to the other side. And it wasn't through muddy waters. It wasn't a trek where they had to drag themselves. No, they walked through on dry ground. All night long, God was blowing back the waters with the wind of heaven and just blowing it back. And they walked through on dry ground. He's reminding them, I made that pathway. Where there seemed to have been no way, I made a way. Where there has seemed to be no way is what he's reminding them of today. He says, I called forth. Notice, I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all his chariots and horses. Again, talking about the enemy that was on their trail, right on their tail. He says, I drew them in. So I called forth and I drew them in beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candlestick. It's candlewick. Notice now, as God said, listen, I made a way and also I dealt with those who were standing in your way. It wasn't you. It was me. So even though I got to discipline you, I'm still reminding you that although I'm disciplining you, I'm not disciplining you for nothing. I'm disciplining you to, to discipline you so that you become disciplined in knowing what it is to trust me, what it is to obey me, what it is to know that my promises are true so that you would know that I have something better for you. So I need to get you into this to get you through this so this way I can take you further because I have more for you is what the Lord is saying to them here. And then verses 18 and 19, which, oh, I love these verses. He says, but forget all that. That's right. I didn't say forget all that. Eunice reminded me I'm from Brooklyn today. So the little talk here is forget all that. That's what a D-A-T. Forget, because, you know, you got to say with a little Brooklyn swag. I'm sorry. Brooklyn's always in the house, okay? You got to forget all that. Everybody say forget all that. That's right. In other words, listen, I know what I did and I know how I did it, but what I need for you right now is to forget all that. Okay? Because what I can't have you do is I can't have you stuck on what I did as if that's all I do. Just focus on who did it because I can do beyond that. So in other words, I might have made a way in the wilderness through the Red Sea, but it may not be another Red Sea. It would be like a Red Sea experience, but don't go back to the Red Sea. Now do it again, God. No, I got something over here that I'm going to do. So forget that, but don't forget who did it. You got to forget the past. That means you got to forget past failures, brothers and sisters. you got to forget the mistakes that you've made. Now, here's what I want to say to you. Don't dwell on the mistakes. Learn from them. That's for all of us. Don't dwell on the mistakes, but learn from the mistakes. Learn. Remind yourself a little bit in terms of what I did, how I did it, and what got me into this trouble in the first place. So don't dwell there, because if you dwell there, you'll stay there. The enemy is so conniving. He's so good at making us feel condemned. He'll keep us in that mud, wallowing in the mud, never getting up from where we're supposed to get up from. But the scripture says this, like little Kamara yesterday, that little boy fell, he had this thing when he fell, he, you know, hurt his little lip, but you know what he did? He got back up and wanted the thing back on him. Bro, you just got hurt, yeah, but you know what? The righteous fall down, but they get up again. And that's what's supposed to happen. Listen, listen, you make mistakes, you learn from the mistakes, but don't stay there and looking at your mistakes because you'll never move on. You'll never feel good enough. You'll never still feel smart enough. You'll never feel like you can make it, but the devil is a liar. Forget all that. Everybody say forget all that. That's right, forget all that, but also forget your victories. That's the most dangerous thing. The victories of, oh, I remember when I used to, and I remember how I used to, and I remember when I did, and I remember, yeah, you're remembering, but what you're not saying is that what I'm doing. 
And so we get so caught up on our victories that that's all we're doing. We're trying to be like camels with the humps and we're trying to live off what we had yesterday or last week. No. How many know he gave them manna? Why? So that every day they got down on their knees and they ate something fresh. Scripture says we go from glory to glory, from faith to faith. God is a progressing God. That's it. We're always moving forward. We never look back. Now, when you look back, you just see how far you've come from. You've heard, it, you've heard me say it. You've heard other people say it, right? The rearview mirror is there for a reason, just to look to see how far you've come and to see what's behind you. But it's never for you to go forward looking in the rearview mirror. You will crash. You will get into a real bad accident. You will, most of us will die if we keep looking back, stuck on the victories, stuck on the failures. So he says, forget all that. Everybody say, forget all that. Now, why do you have to forget all that? Because here's what God says to them. Forget, them. forget what I did in terms of how I did it. Uh, forget what I did, but don't forget that I'm the one who did it. He says, forget all that because it is nothing. Now, this is the word of the Lord for us. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. Yeah. Let me say it again. Forget all that because it is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. That's what the Lord wants to say to us. So don't get so caught up on what happened. Get caught up on the one who made it happen. Because I'm the God who creates. Right now, the telescopes are finding all types of things. And it's amazing. All networks are, these news networks are saying, look how amazing this is. I cannot believe it. This is that. And this is that. And I promise you, I sit in my office, I watch, I go, of course it's amazing. We serve an amazing God. How can it not be amazing? Everything he does is amazing. Everything he touches is fabulous. Fantabulous, if I could use that word. All right? So if he does that with stars planets come on you are called by his name you are redeemed you are chosen you haven't we have not seen yet what it is that he wants to do in our lives if we would just trust him and it may not be a grand scale thing that the world would say oh look how wonderful but you'll know it's wonderful you know what it might be it might be you saying, God, you know I ain't got a dime to get on this bus. And the probability is that they may let me go or they may say, you know what, I got to get off the bus. But I serve a God who reminds me I ain't seen nothing yet. I know he did it in the past. I know he can do it. So, God, I'm just going to trust you. Oh, oh, what's that shiny thing? Oh, it's a dime. It's exactly what I needed to get on the bus. Did she testify? Is that what she said? See, that's what our God does. That's what our God does. That's what I've got. So you tell me, what's more fabulous? The person, uh, the, the big money, got all these billions of dollars, or somebody who learns to trust God for a dime? The person who learns to trust God for a dime. Because you're reminded that he is gyrus. Now, see, the songs are intentional. Because they're not just songs to have a beat and a drum and go excited. It's a song to get in your heart, brothers and sisters, that he is gyrus. He's the one who provides your testimony. You're not dead, so he's not done. You have not yet seen what God's going to do in your life if you just trust him. So what do we got to do? Forget all that. So you forget all that. Forget the past. He says, for I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? Notice now. So forget the past, but focus on the now. I've already begun. Do you not see it? Do you not see it? And if you don't see it, be honest, God, I don't see it. And that's where you go to God and say, God, open my eyes to see what you're talking about. Because God, I don't see it. And I promise you, when you get along with God, the Holy Spirit would open your eyes and you begin to say, oh, that's why I lost that job. That's why they're no longer in my life. That's why I got sick. I know sickness is not of you, but you use whatever you got to do, God, to get a hold of my life. I see, God, you've already begun this thing that is nothing compared to what you've done in the past. So you focus on the now by God opening your eyes. And here's the thing. Here's the last thing, right? Have faith in the future. Have faith. What is faith? Uh, the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, and faith needs an object. Now, like I said to you, I think it was last week or the week before, we put our faith in something. Put your faith in someone. Put your faith in God. Can I tell you something about God, what I've learned about God? And of course, all this is made available to us in terms of his, him being faithful to us and consistent in our lives is because we've placed our faith in Jesus. 
right? We don't just say God, we understand. We get to serve God because Jesus laid down his life for us. And because of his shed blood, we have access to this holy God who calls us his own. But here's what, I, here's what I've learned about God. When I put my faith in him, I may not see it, but when I believe it, what I believe, I begin to see it. When I believe what he's dropped in my heart, not what I believe what other people say. We're going to be talking about that for the next few weeks here. But when I believe what God said, how many know God keeps his word, right? So imagine these people, when God is telling them, you're going into captivity, they know that's going to happen because they see the signs. But then the good news is, but you won't stay in captivity because I'm going to work out my plan while you're in captivity. This is why Jeremiah 29, 11 is such a great verse for so many people. He's telling them while you're in captivity, let me remind you something. For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you a hope in the future, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Wow. When is he saying that? While they're in captivity. We say it all the time to remind you, don't let your circumstance dictate the fact what God said to you. Don't look at your circumstance and feel like God's forgotten about you. His plans are still intact for you. We just got to get in line with him. Somebody please say amen. We just got to get in line with him. So here it is. Faith in the future. What? I will. Everybody say he will. will. He will. will. That's right. He will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Wilderness could be a dry spot for many people or just a place of wandering. Depending on you, you, the bottom line is that you feel hopeless. You feel without direction in the wilderness. But he says, in the wilderness, I'm going to make a path for you. When I go walking and I hit these trails, let me tell you something. I rely on those paths. Otherwise, this man will be lost. And I swear I heard some bears not too long ago. Right? I want to stay on the path that I'm supposed to stay on. I need to see those signs that let me know, keep going on the green, keep going on the red. And I'm grateful that as we stay in line with him, he begins to show us the, the different signs that we need to know to stay on course. That in that wilderness, guess what he'll do? He'll make a pathway and he'll create rivers in a wasteland. Listen, he did it with a rock. Water came from a rock while they were in the wilderness. And two million people got their thirst quenched. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, brothers and sisters. So we're going to forget the past. We're going to focus on the now, the present, right? And what are we going to do? Have faith in the future. Why is that? Because all of our faith is in him and him alone. So everybody say, forget all that. All right, y'all sound like y'all from Jersey. All right, if you're from Brooklyn, come on, you got to sound like you're from Brooklyn, okay? Say, forget all that. I'm telling you, you, I ain't going to stop until you get it right. Come on, forget all that. Forget all that. that. Come on, let's put our hands together and bless the Lord. (laughs) Father, we thank you as we all stand. Let's all stand. Father, we thank you for songs that minister to our hearts. And we know, Lord, blessed you. Thank you, Lord, for your word that you had for the Israelites prior to going into captivity and a word for them while they were in captivity. And God, that word even applies to us today, God, because there are going to be some new things you're going to show us. You even said in your word in the Corinthians, it says, I has not seen nor ear has heard all the things that God has in store for those who love him. Yet you will go on to say, yet the spirit reveals it to us. And so, God, even though we haven't seen it yet, the spirit of God will reveal those things to us. But we haven't seen it yet, but we know we're going to receive it because you spoke it. So even as the song we just finished singing reminds us of what it says in Psalm 27, 13 and 14. I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living as I forget the past, focus on the present and have faith in the future. In Jesus name, let's put our hands together and say amen. 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 God bless you. See you Tuesday night. Come on, be with us on Tuesday. God bless you.